Coming up, it's land back for a tribe in Utah. Pueblos take steps to help indigenous farmers and what was promised at the end of the Trail of Tears. I'm Mackenzie Allen Charmley. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Chinangale, we're so glad you could join us. Aaliyah is away. We start in the great state of Alaska, where the Biden administration is restoring protections to the Tongass National Forest. Last week marked a long-awaited victory for Alaska Natives who petitioned the U.S. Department of Agriculture to reinstate forest protections. The agency announced it would once again ban logging and the construction of roads for cutting timber in over half of the Tongass. In 2020, former President Donald Trump removed those measures on 9 million acres of land in the largest national forest in the U.S. Indigenous communities rely on the area to hunt deer and fish salmon that swim in streams kept cold by the old growth forest. Environmental advocates say these protections need to be made permanent, which would require congressional approval. And now to Montana, where a new bill could codify protections for Native children into state law. The Montana Indian Child Welfare Act is modeled after federal legislation with the same name. In 1978, Congress passed ICWA in response to the high number of Indigenous children removed from their nations and cultures. This week, the state's House and Human Services Committee heard testimony in support of the bill. MICWA has formal support from all tribal nations in the state and is widely accepted as best practices for protecting Native children. Montana is the worst state in the country when it comes to child removal. Native children make up 9% of the total child population, but account for 35% of all children in the foster care system. Tensions are already high with anti-Indigenous sentiments coming from Montana lawmakers. Earlier this year, a state senator brought a draft resolution seeking to dismantle tribal territories. The resolution featuring intense bias toward Native nations was later withdrawn. In Australia, an unusual type of teacher is helping to revitalize Indigenous language while sharing his wisdom around identity and acceptance. ICT senior producer Vincent Monez has this story. The Indigenous languages of Australia have suffered due to the effects of colonization but recent revitalization efforts are working hard to try to bring them back to life. Enter Mr. Beaky the Budgie and his owner, Indigenous educator Cassie Latham. Budgies, or common parakeets, are known to be able to speak a few words, and Mr. Beaky is using all of them to help his two-legged relatives. Beaky would have to be the only budgie recorded ever to speak Aboriginal languages because we're reviving our languages because it was taken away. Hi guys! Hi. Mr. Beaky shares his knowledge of Indigenous languages all across the schools in his home state. Latham says having a bird that speaks an Aboriginal language blows her students' minds and they want to listen to more. And this fine feathered friend is no one trick pony. In a recent book dedicated to the kids of one elementary school, Mr. Beaky also talked about Aboriginal identity. Just because I'm not green doesn't mean I can't be seen. It's something that really hits home, especially for me being a fair-skinned Aboriginal. So coming to schools, I get asked, are you really Aboriginal? You're not dark enough to be Aboriginal. Like there's this, I've grown up with identity issues all my life. 
and I've always had to justify my skin color, you know, my eye color, everything. Mr. Beaky the Budgie may be a small relative, but he is showing that everyone can help to make a big impact for indigenous cultures. In Bismarck, North Dakota, Vincent Monas, ICT News. This year, the National Football League's big game in Arizona will feature an indigenous trade language. The National Association of the Deaf announced that this year's Super Bowl will feature an indigenous deaf performer. Navajo Nation citizen Colin Denny will perform America the Beautiful with words from indigenous sign language. Denny comes from a family of teachers, and one of his personal goals is to master the ancient way of communicating. Plains Indian Sign Language, also called hand talk, is a system of fixed hand and finger positions symbolizing ideas. The precursor to American Sign Language was used to trade among nations that could not directly speak to each other. You can catch Colin's performance at this year's Super Bowl on February 12th. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. At the end of the Trail of Tears, there was a promise. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch wrote in the decision of McGirt v. Oklahoma. A new book examines the implication of that decision. Co-authored by Robbie Etheridge and Robert J. Miller, A Promise Kept explores the ramification of this decision. Here's Professor Miller. I have called this case a bombshell. The impact on the state of Oklahoma, on all of the 39 tribal nations that are located in Oklahoma, and on the United States is going to be enormous. 43% of the state is now Indian country, where state law is limited and where tribal law is at its strongest and lots of federal Indian law and policies apply there. So last year's Supreme Court ruling of um, Castro Huerta had a huge impact. What does that mean um, for McGirt? Almost all the press got that case wrong. Every headline said that the court had somehow, in the 2022 case of Castro Huerta, had cut back on McGirt. No, the Mag Castro Huerta case had nothing to do with McGirt itself. The Castro Huerta case came about because Oklahoma is fighting McGirt. But the decision of the Supreme Court in June of 22 in Castro Huerta granted states a power over crimes by non-Indians in Indian country. That's a power that tribal nations have never had, at least according to the Supreme Court. So the Castro Huerta case did not impact McGirt itself. You are from the Eastern Shawnee tribe. How did that impact um, your government? Well, part of the bombshell that I said is that the McGirt case will affect other tribes in Oklahoma. And since McGirt was decided, as you said, in July of 2020, the Oklahoma courts have re-recognized the boundaries, the reservations of eight or nine other tribes. And I am wearing my tribal symbol. My tribe's reservation from 1888 is in the process of being re-recognized in the Oklahoma courts. So the McGirt decision that Indian country still exists until Congress and or a tribal nation choose to make it smaller, that is the law. And Oklahoma ignored that law for 114 years, and regrettably, the United States government allowed Oklahoma to act as if there were no tribal nations there, no reservations. And so Justice Gorsuch's opinion, and, and we borrowed the title of our book from the line you read. This is the opening line in his July 20 opinion. At the end of the Trail of Tears was a promise. And I knew the tribes had won the case when he opens the opinion with that line. So this is very significant to my tribe and to the other tribes in Oklahoma. Professor Miller, what are you hoping audiences take away um, and readers take away from your book? Well, the, the, the longest chapter in our book is our anticipating the consequences of McGirt. Justice Gorsuch wrote this in his opinion. He hoped that the tribes and the state and the feds could negotiate and enter cooperative agreements, compacts they're called, they're really just contracts, to handle tax issues, criminal issues, court issues, zoning, water, Indian child welfare issues. Every one of these issues is impacted. But what has, I've now forgotten your question, but what has, what I hope will happen is that kind of cooperative effort. But so far the state and the governor are still in such shock from McGirt that they are fighting the decision tooth and nail in the public press, in the courts, 
and probably in the back rooms of Congress. So what we predict in the book is over 30 years of litigation while each one of these little individual issues gets played out. The state has already lost a claim that it could still control surface mining of coal in eastern Oklahoma. Well, now that we know this is Indian country, the state has no power to do that. And a federal court just held that in November 9th. The state has appealed that. The state is claiming that it uh, can still tax native people in a certain circumstance, I'm certain that will be overruled. That decision was just in October. So I'm afraid we're going to see 30 years of litigation. So upon compiling the book, um, writing the book, doing all the research, um, what is your, what is something unique about, um, about this case, about this story that we, um, that is important to Indian country? Well, all of Indian country is happy about the McGirt decision. It applies specifically just to the Muscogee Creek Nation. But it shows that Justice Gorsuch continues to be a pretty strong advocate for enforcing treaty rights. According to the Constitution, treaties are the supreme law of the land. And Oklahoma, in this particular situation, and as I said, regrettably, the U.S. let this happen, Oklahoma acted like these treaties didn't exist and that these reservations didn't exist. So the strongest point for all of Indian country and the whole 50 states is that Justice Gorsuch and the court upheld treaty rights, held the United States feet to the fire and Oklahoma's feet to the fire. Because this decision is why I called it a bombshell. It's an enormous impact on the tribal governments, the state of Oklahoma and the United States as issues of jurisdiction, taxation, criminal matters all get readjusted to this new reality. While we're wrapping our time here, we have time for one more question. Um, I wanted to ask what other projects you're working on? Well, I'm currently writing an article with a professor from Australia about the doctrine of discovery. The United States claims to control European, to, uh, Indian nations, excuse me, and to have rights over them. This is a famous Supreme Court case that's 200 years old, Johnson v. McIntosh, that adopted the international law of colonialism that we call the doctrine of discovery. So Professor Harry Hobbs and I are comparing what the U.S. and Australia have done to maybe back away from colonialism. So that's my latest project that's keeping me busy. That was author Robert Miller. Going south to New Mexico, the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center is investing in agriculture. It offers free training and resources for native farmers. Earlier this week, I spoke with Marianne Billy. She's the Cultural Center's special projects manager. Well, yes, so here at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, we are working on developing out programming and facility to support our local native entrepreneurs. And we decided to go heavy on focusing on food and farm uh, businesses. So this first set of trainings will be to support them kind of in a general, general, generally speaking, with business and marketing as day one. They receive access to Chromebooks, to some software subscriptions that will help them in formulating their budget and business plan. And then the next two days will go into their tier training, food safety, farm safety plans, and helping them get to a statewide food supplier list. Farming is integral to a lot of Native communities. Why was this program something the Cultural Center wanted to offer, um, and was there already interest from the community? Oh, definitely. It speaks directly to our mission to support our, uh, to perpetuate Pueblo culture, but also to offer opportunities for economic advancement and helping our people and the local neighborhood really reach their levels and definition for success. And of course, that speaks directly to kind of our roots with agriculture, farming, and supplying food to our community, to our family for sustenance, and also potentially now in a new market, uh, moving it out of community with that type of uh, produce and product. What are you ultimately hoping people will be getting from the experience? Primarily, and I think what young business owners or even not even necessarily young business owners need is community. And sometimes, far, especially farming and any entrepreneurial work can seem lonely. 
and you're doing it by yourself, so to speak. But when you can come into a room and meet with people who have similar interests, similar problems and challenges, and come from similar backgrounds, that can really uh, be a spur to move them on to their next level and, and keep going and keep moving. And then also is to provide some of that technical support and, and training and marketing essentials and business essentials that we're hearing from the farmers. This is kind of what they're, they're needing and they're wanting is how we treat our farm that we've been doing maybe for generations and, and treat it like a business to that it can support my community, can support my family. When it comes to entrepreneurship, what are your views on natives entering um, that space? For the Indian Pueblo um, Cultural Center, we're uh, entrepreneurial in spirit. Our uh, Pueblos and natives forever have been innovated, innovative and have been problem solvers, have really reached to support their community and have been truly resilient in our work. So I think that spirit and translating it into a modern era is, is very powerful. And we support uh, any opportunity for our native people to reach their levels and goals for success. And for many of them, it's kind of venturing out and uh, taking work that maybe has been in their family for generations and moving it into uh, a, a new era that will be kind of on a business and also um, what our state needs currently right now to support our, our local food system and also infuse some traditional tr traditional foods into the current market. The program will flow into a kitchen facility that's being developed. What other ways do you see um, the cultural center using that addition? It'll be it's going to be designed around food and farm businesses. So we kind of anticipate that it will help support catering businesses, food trucks, along with local farms and hopefully um, aggregating that in some capacity and moving it out into a larger scale, whether it's institutions like uh, senior center homes, Head Start or early childhood facility schools and moving that out and possibly even to a uh, retail format. You've offered other businesses and marketing programs in the past. What other programs are you hoping to offer in the future? Um, how do you see the cultural center expanding? So this department, or this is going to be a brand new department for uh, the cultural center under our nonprofit arm, and it's called the Entrepreneur Complex, which yes has facility and yes has programming, and it's our first step. This Native Farmer Training, which we foresee will continue cycling through either yearly or, or biannually. But we hope to hear uh, and develop programming based on the needs we're hearing from uh, our business owners, whether that's farmers or those who are interested in, in doing value added product off of fresh produce or, or fresh um, items. So we're really starting to hear from the farmers that their need is, is a spectrum. That was Marianne Billy. January 29th marked the 160th anniversary of the Bear River Massacre. In Utah, hundreds of Shoshone were killed. Now, the Northwestern Band of Shoshone is restoring the land to tell their stories. I interviewed Vice Chairman and Natural Resources Officer Bradley Perry. Take a look. Yeah, um, so like you said, 160 years ago, uh, the, the volunteer army that was stationed at Fort Douglas in Salt Lake City, Utah, marched about 120 miles north of Salt Lake into our winter camp. And so for thousands of years, right now, we would be at our at our hot springs camp, or what we call Bull Ogoy, um, to rejuvenate. Um, and so uh, this time of year was always a happy time of year for all Shoshone bands to come in and, and camp there and, uh, and, and, and do the warm dance, start to bring on spring, you know, get to talk and converse with each other. So this is a really sacred time for us. It all changed in one day, um, January 29th, when we lost uh, between 450 and 500 people just to sheer brutality. And um, so it, to try and reclaim that uh, back, the tribe purchased the land, the massacre site land in 2018. And so now we're trying to change the story from, yes, this was, 
this is a massacre site, but it also was a site we came to for a thousand years, and, and we want to we want to make sure that we celebrate that, yet honor those that have fallen there. And what kind of work have you done at the actual site of the massacre, and why has that been so important um, to look at this painful past? So currently, we have um, grants from the Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Interior, um, and several you know, private organizations have funded us. Uh, the first thing that we're doing is removing um, invasive species like Russian olive or Phragmite that wouldn't have been there uh, when we camped there. So it would have been unrecognizable and it's something we, we, can't, we don't use culturally. It also takes a lot of water out of the system. And, uh, you know, the tribe wants to, we want to return water to the Great Salt Lake. We want to make sure that we're doing everything as culturally possible as we can. Uh, we've done, you know, uh, several archaeological walkthroughs with the University of Utah. Uh, we've, we've taken LIDAR and we've, we've basically been able to map and draw out exactly what we want to do uh, to actually move uh, what is now called Battle Creek, but at the time was called Beaver Creek, out of an irrigation system and back into a free-flowing system that, that runs across our, our land the way it used to. So those that are buried there can recognize uh, uh, what we're doing and that, that it will be a place that they feel a little bit more comfortable with willows and cottonwoods rather than, you know, hay and, and uh, invasive species. So uh, we, we've cleared about 30 acres of, of uh, Russian olive trees, which is about 300,000 trees. And uh, we've got another 20 acres to go. And then We've, we've started replanting, uh, like I said, native cottonwoods, native willows, and other plants uh, native to the site. And so uh, we've done all our clearances and, and we're, ready to, we're ready to move forward this year. You're also working on building a Shoshone Cultural and Interpretive Center and Amphitheater. What is your goal with these and how do you see um, the, cen the center and the amphitheater impacting the tribe? Um, so, yeah, we, you know, we, our tribe isn't, you know, real traditional in that we were never given a reservation. Uh, we did go and live together in Utah, but we've never had a place to gather that was our own. And so having, having a cultural interpretive center where we can share not only what happened, you know, 160 years ago during the massacre, but about our culture and how we are still here, how we still live, how we can still use the same plants um, and give our, give our tribal members a place to come and, and connect that's ours. And so they can feel like they're on their home ground. Uh, the amphitheater will be a place where we can, we can gather uh, on the 29th of January and look out, be able to be seated and look out over the site and, and discuss, you know, uh, the tribal issues. And really it, it, it's important to the tribe to just get these things so we can help anyone in, in the general public to understand uh, who we are and what we do. And what has the process been like um, in getting something like this built from its idea and design um, to now? It's, it's, been, it's been large. I mean, we, we have a fully designed building. We have a fully designed site. Um, we started that in 2018 and, and uh, we've just been cleared to, to move dirt. So it's, it's taken Almost five. Well, it has. It's taken five years to get to this point to where we are beginning to heavily fundraise to to build these things. Um, you know, the the ecological restoration is fully funded through uh, federal grants, but uh, the interpretive center and you know the brick and mortar and, and those types of things, uh, we are we are pushing forward on on fundraising. But it's been a long process and it's been an enjoyable process because we are putting together our history and and we are excited to display it. That was Bradley Perry. ICT was at the anniversary of the Bear River Massacre. Rosalind Yazzie has this story. An estimated 500 members of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone lost their lives on January 29, 1863, at the hands of Colonel Patrick E. Connors' regiment. Northwest Band of Shoshone Councilman Darren Perry looks towards the future of his people. The events of the Bear River Massacre may be forgotten by many, but the councilman hopes a new generation will have a desire to listen and learn. And Perry feels this tragedy does not define his nation. He says today they are strong and thriving. 
Vice Chairman and Natural Resources Officer for the tribe, Bradley Perry, talked about the Bo'ogoy Cultural Interpretive Center they plan to build. The nation also has plans for ecological restoration at the site to honor their ancestors. It, it looks, it doesn't look anything like uh, our people, you know, uh, show band, Northwestern band, Eastern band would have recognized um, 160 years ago. Uh, the trees are all gone, replaced by invasive species. The, the water's been channelized. And we want to reverse all that, take out the invasive, replant all of the native species and, and free the water to run its own course over the land to bring fish back and to bring wildlife back. That's so important for our people. Fort Hall resident and Eastern Shoshone citizen, Ronald Brahman, says it's important to attend the memorial to pay tribute to his family members who survived. Brahman says a little boy saved during the battle was the start of the Pingree family, which he descends from on his maternal side. I come for strength, come for healing, um, and um, just come to remember. Honor songs hung in the cold winter air for the many indigenous people who were lost that day, and each name of the 38 recorded known casualties were read out loud. In Preston, Idaho, Rosalind Yazi, ICT News. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.